exploratory committee to order. Um, the members of the advisory committee that I see present, Stephanie Smith, Carrie Jaguer, um, Nader Hashim, Chris Walsh, Meg Delia. Um, we're missing Jim, but we've got enough to get going. So um, this is the inaugural meeting. Thanks for kind of getting this on your calendars. Um, and essentially what this committee is designed to do um, is look at some of the more controversial issues um, that the legislature asked the board to make recommendations on. Um, I think the initial list that I had kind of sent around included debating some of these new and maybe different license types beyond the ones that we've approved. This would include cooperatives, um, direct to consumer, farm to consumer um, licenses, um, the limited space license, that's the kind of like a, maybe like a cannabis kiosk in a general store, um, kind of a, a store within a store concept. Um, also looking at issues around concentrates, potency limits, on-site consumption, special mm -hmm. event permitting, um, curbside sales, delivery, um, and honestly, whatever else comes up, I, I know that um, all of those issues were debated in the legislature and no one could kind of really come to a consensus on, on any of those. And so they asked the cannabis board to make recommendations. And so we're gonna turn to our advisory committee to debate some of those issues. But for today, um, we're gonna have a, a much more narrowly tailored meeting. Um, we have a report to the legislature due um, in, on November 1st, and there's really three issues that they've asked us to look at. Um, the first issue, I'll, I'll mention them all, and then I'm gonna ask Kerry if he wouldn't mind uh, kind of walking us through some of, some of the kind of the contours of the debate on the three. Um, the first issue is um, the board needs to make a recommendation as to whether integrated license holders, product manufacturers um, should be permitted to produce solid concentrate products with greater than 60% THC for the purposes of incorporation into other cannabis products that otherwise comply with the prohibited product section. So the way that I read this, and maybe I'm reading it wrong, but the way that I see this is mm -hmm. Any solid concentrate above 60% is per se illegal. However, um, there is an argument to be made that a product manufacturer who is not gonna be selling a solid concentrate above 60% directly to the public or to a retailer should be allowed to make them and then dilute them later or have a kind of subsequent, you know, retail or someone else on the supply chain dilute it. So as long as the final product at the point of sale is below the 60% THC concentrate. That's the way I'm reading that. Um, and uh, Carrie, I know you've looked at this language in the past. I'm wondering if you can kind of uh, maybe talk us through your thoughts on this. Um, and, and you know, you're probably more familiar because of the hemp program than a lot of us um, about solid concentrates and the product manufacturing. So um, maybe you can kind of hit on some of the high notes or the high points of the, of the debate. Um, yeah, uh, let me just start off by saying it would be almost virtually impossible to create a concentrate that's, that's um, less than 60% 60, 60 or less right off the bat. Um, if any concentrate you make is going to be higher than that. You can't really, um, whether it's a mechanical extraction, you're extracting heat, um, that original product, as, as soon as it's extracted, is going to be above 60%. Um, it, whether it's solid or liquid, the original extraction until it's diluted is going to be above 60%. Um, the way that we sort of dealt with higher potency concentrates in the hemp program, uh, <coughs> Stephanie can elaborate as well, as we called sort of that original concentrate um, a process intermediate. 
Yep. Um, so that process intermediate in the hemp program specifically, um, you'll have a concentrated hemp extract that that when the plant started below 0.3 or 0.3 or below uh, THC, when you concentrate it, it's four or five or six percent uh, THC. And the point of compliance that we've insisted upon is the point of sale. So you need to bring that down to 0.3 or below in one of your products. And I think the same would hold true with THC. Um, right now, some of the uh, the easiest way to formulate a product is is from a distillate, and those are nearly 100%. And you will be the most accurate when adding that to a baked good, uh, baked cartridge, or any other concentrate product that's being made. Um, that said, the, the law as written would make it virtually impossible to um, make any concentrate or edible other than by an oil infusion, where the material is infused in oil, coconut oil or butter, um, would be the only way that we could make edibles under the current law. Um, those solid or liquid concentrates when extracted will by nature um, be above 60%. So as written, the law is unworkable. Um, so uh, can we, can I just open this up for discussion? I, I don't want to kind of dominate this. I really want the input of the subcommittee. Stephanie, do you have anything you want to add to this in particular? I just echo what um, Carrie said, is that we, we've navigated this by requiring that um, concentrates trade um, between registrants of the program and, uh, and just being clear that they're not considered products to be sold to the public because it is impossible. <laughs> um, and you're limiting what you can do and you're adding costs like and process and potentially harmful things maybe, I don't know. <laughs> So, um, when you say yeah. add potentially harmful things, can you elaborate on that? Um, well, I think you're by cutting your concentrate, possibly. I mean, not maybe not a solid concentrate, um, unless you're further diluting it into something. But just you know, managing what you can actually add to to meet the standard, which is the what what you're talking about. Like you have to add things to it. Maybe Carrie or others can comment on what are typically added or what can be seen as an additive? Yeah, I, I well, it seems like Nader's got his hand up. Um, maybe I can go afterwards, or should I just go? I just have a quick question, if that's okay. You got it. Uh, so concentrates aren't really um, something I know a ton about um, for this conversation, and so forgive me if this has already been repeated, but uh, could somebody just uh, summarize for me again one more time why two license holders or two businesses would trade concentrates with each other but not with the public? Yeah, uh, Nader, I'll take a shot at it really quickly. So I'm I'm producing either uh, chocolate bars or brownies or gummies, but I'm not growing anything. I'm a processor, and I'm going to buy extract from somebody else. I'm gonna I'll have somebody else do that work of extraction and I'm just going to add it to my baked goods and I'm going to need to know how much THC is in that extract. And if the processor has to bring it down below 60%, they're gonna add something else to it. And um, it makes it less accurate for, for me to formulate my product. If I know what I'm buying from you is 100%, I can weigh out the exact amount to get a certain amount of milligrams per edible, if you will. Um, if it's something other, if it's brought down, if it's diluted and brought down below 60%, I need a, a lab analysis to come with it, and I will then have to reformulate my product every time I go to make a new batch. Got it. All right. That's a great explanation. Thank you. Hey, this is Chris Walsh. Um, so, you know, the thing that 
dawned on me recently after we all kind of chimed in on the manufacturing licenses is um, it's really a shame that we have this 60% threshold because the two cleanest, safest, healthiest, and least dangerous to produce concentrates being ice hash and rosin, which are also the least expensive to make. So that tier two manufacturing license, I would imagine that would be a lot of what they would make. I don't know how you can make those products where they come out at less than 60% and they're solidless, so they're really not designed to be diluted. So I, I just, you know, your, 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 your two cleanest concentrates <clears throat> would have to be manipulated before they're put on the market. Chris, I agree with you 100%. Um, but we're talking about that that'll be a topic that will have to be brought up separately. The legislature sort of specifically asked about passing concentrates higher than 60% between manufacturers. And I, I think that has to be a yes. And the point of the point of compliance for the 60% would in need in fact need to be their point of retail sale. Um, that said, you're absolutely correct and it would be a shame to have to produce a more harmful, less pure product um, out of your sort of ice hash or rosin. Well, my only thought there is that, uh, you know, we would see some hemp um, ice hash being added to, but then again, you're you're destroying the profile. So I, I don't exactly know how to do it myself, but uh, agree that it shouldn't be diluted. That's, that's my point, is that you, you really can't dilute rosin or ice hash, unless you bring CBD trichomes into it. So, um, I'm trying to think what the, so the unintended consequence from what I'm hearing of this policy that just straight up prohibits at any point in the production chain, a concentrate above 60% is essentially we're either eliminating the edibles market and the vape market altogether, or we're adding some unknown element to those products uh, that will just make the process untenable to make the, to the, you know, you're adding some, you're adding some adulterant to the process uh, that who knows what happens when you consume or, or inhale. Um, so, you know, um, Pepper, yeah. look, look, before you get too far, it, it won't eliminate the edibles market. Um, it will just add additional lab analysis to different points of that process um, because you could easily extract into a butter or a coconut oil, um, but then your, your concentration in that oil is unknown. So if we're trying to keep a tight market on how many milligrams can go into an edible, we're making it harder for producers to do that. Well, yeah. just, just to add to that, James, um, you're also discouraging the safest and least expensive and cleanest ways to make concentrates, the solventless ice hash and the rosin. And, you know, I if someone goes to that tier two manufacturing license where they aren't gonna use fluorocarbons and need a safe room and all that expense, I, I don't really know, you know, I don't know what else they're gonna make. And I would, I know we're not talking about removing that, that language right now, but um, yeah, I do believe the folks that want those dabs are just going to buy flour and bring it home and blast it themselves. So we'll be having home butane extractions going on. And I'd like to hear from other folks if they, if they believe that would happen. I, 
yeah, I'll speak up again. Yeah, that'll definitely happen. People will make dabs at home and they'll purchase dabs uh, on the unregulated market. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. So uh, this this um, 60% concentrate law, actually the unintended consequence, it absolutely does the opposite of what the legislature was intending in that it makes the product, the end product, potentially more dangerous and also encourages uh, a black market. And James, why did I say it makes it more dangerous is, is what when the legislature did this is when they were hearing specifically about vape cartridges with, that were making people ill. Um, the thought was that vitamin E or lanolin was being used to dilute the extract. Um, cartridges now are, are pure rosin or pure extract or terpene diluted with a terpene blend, um, safer to inhale. We're sort of encouraging the innovation and <laughs> values, which we probably should not be doing. So the, the, the law that was meant to protect people is actually discouraging um, that pure clean market. Completely. Well, it's it's, yeah, that, that's what I was trying to get at was I wasn't in the room when this prohibited product was introduced. It seems to me like from all, all that I know about the legislature uh, that they probably had a concern about children or cannabis induced psychosis with these high concentrates. So I think they were really more concerned about them, these products not making it into the market, not that if not if there if there's never any kind of direct of THC concentrate at, you know above sixty percent their concern will never be realized um, so I don't know I mean I, I read you know David Silverman submitted a comment he, I think he was in the room um, when uh, this this issue was being debated um, and I think his thinking was the same as what I just said which is that. They don't want these products on the shelves, but if they're if they're ultimately compliant, they shouldn't be per se illegal at every step of the supply chain. Nader, do you have a comment? Yeah, just wanted to go along with what you're saying or uh, confirm what you were saying is that there certainly was a level of fear uh, about concentrates or products that were at a higher potency level. Um, there's still a lot of really old stigma and mentality towards cannabis. Um, and so, you know, the, the word psychosis and we're often brought up and, you know, as well as this fear of children getting a hold of um, high concentrate cannabis products. So, yeah, just, just confirming what you were discussing. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure that we need much more debate on this. I mean, because I think I'm hearing at least a majority of folks. Meg, do you want to weigh in, actually? I, I tend to agree with Chris. I think uh, it will, the unintended consequences will absolutely push people to the illicit market. Um, and, you know, ensuring that products are as safe as possible, I think it, it just doesn't really make sense to have this uh, ban on the 60 percent in the manufacturing process and the the <clears throat> this is chris um the irony of this is you know i'm not even saying to jack the threshold up that much because most solventless product concentrate products like hash or rosin come in around 70 percent you know they're not the ultra concentrated like butane or the hydrocarbons where they can come in at like 90%. So you're almost there, but you know, I mean, maybe I'm saying this selfishly because I find these products on a personal level, like very clean and safe, but it's just a shame that the way it is right now, you really couldn't make these pure products without adulterating them. And then the other irony is the most 
dangerous way to make concentrates is the easiest way to dilute down to 60 percent. So, you know, it's like you've got the worst of both worlds. Well, Bryn, um, are, you, are you listening in on this? I am. Is, is it, would it be outside of our purview, or certainly outside of our purview, would it would be a bad idea to make a recommendation about solid concentrates more generally alongside this recommendation? I think that this report, the November 1st report, is the time to make that recommendation since we were directed to look at this issue in general. I don't think it would be outside the board's purview to, to make an additional recommendation. Okay. Well, Chris, I think I know your point of view on this, and Stephanie and Carrie, you know, I think I've heard, I've heard the kind of contours of the debate. I know that, you know, you guys, this is a policy decision that the board needs to make, but I think I hear kind of the considerations that we should be making. Nader, do you have a feeling one way or the other if we should make a recommendation that would allow um, concentrates to be sold directly to consumers um, that would be above, solid concentrates above 60%? Sorry, James, did you call my name? I was losing reception for a second. Uh, yeah, sorry, I just, I was curious if you had a feeling um, one way or the other, and if you need more time or more research, that's a totally acceptable answer, but whether you had a thought um, about making a recommendation around allowing, um, I guess, removing solid concentrates above 60% from the prohibited list generally. Yes, I'm, I'm in support of that. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, this isn't something that's in my wheelhouse and the conversation we've had in the last 20 minutes has been pretty efficient in explaining the situation to me. So, um, and you know, one of my concerns from what I'm hearing are the dilutants that would go into it, um, which, you know, it, it, it would, uh, I think it would uh, be a catch 22 and we'd still be causing harm by putting dilutants into these products to keep them under 60 percent so I'm, I'm in support um meg did you want to weigh in just more generally about removing the 60 percent cap on solid concentrates from the prohibited product list i'm sorry could you say that again i don't know why it just caught up when you said that Sorry, it's, I'm, I'm in a parking lot, it might be me. Um, uh, do you have a thought just more generally about the board recommending um, removing solid concentrates above 60% um, from the prohibited product list? Um, I, I would tend to agree. Um, I think just going back to what I think it was Carrie initially said, that yes, if people are looking to get those, it will just push them to the illicit market and it's better to know that those products are uh, being regulated and safe. Okay. And Jim, sorry uh, about the technical difficulties. Okay. So the, the conversation started with our November 1st report, which is um, the legislature wanted us to say um, whether or not you know, between maybe a product manufacturer and a retailer or a wholesaler, as long as the 60% concentrate never, or above 60% concentrate never actually hit the market, the consumer market, whether uh, we should allow concentrates above 60%. The general consensus is yes. You know, there's a number of policy reasons why it makes sense, a number of health, public health reasons why it makes sense. The conversation then moved to whether we should just remove the concentrates um, above 60% from the prohibited product list altogether. Um, and I'm wondering if you had a, a thought about that. Yeah, I, I do. A, I would absolutely uh, agree that we should remove it from uh, the prohibited products. I, I agree that we'll just, uh, it, it's widely uh, used products, and I think we'll just push people to the illicit market where things are made with. Uh, solvents that we, we won't be able to control. Uh, also, from my point of view, as <clears throat> a medical product, concentrates above 60% uh, 
uh, including things like hashish, are key products. We've had witnesses uh, tell us tell us that many times. And my concern is that we uh, prohibit it as a retail product, or at the very least, as an ingredient, uh, sub ingredient for retail products. It's going to negatively affect a lot of patients in the medical program. It'll become something that is labor intensive and cost prohibitive for uh, businesses to produce. <clears throat> Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, I just want I didn't just wanted to weigh in uh, one last time here. And that's <laughs> from a different perspective, not the regulatory perspective, but the marketing perspective. Um, so what is Vermont's market? What will be Vermont's market? And it's going to be the, the higher end products. Um, everybody's harvesting their two plants or two or six plants right now. Um, nobody's necessarily in the market for, for flour, um, unless it's really high end flour. So the Vermont market will be the, the boutique, the small scale, high end extract whether that's a live rosin or live resin. Um, and we're essentially taking that away from Vermont from a marketing perspective as well. So we're leaving Massachusetts, Colorado, New York, uh, the surrounding states, the entities that are producing the, the higher end products, the boutique products that I think are what we should be looking to capture in the state. Um, the flower market saturated, it will be these higher end, pure live rosin type concentrates. Lots of terpenes, very pure. Um, Chris, is that hand a new hand or is that an old hand? That's, uh, that's an old hand. Sorry, I don't even see it. That's all right. Okay, um, I mean, one other just element to this, I know, uh, you know, there's the medical program has been kind of very tightly controlled for a long time. There's a, probably a lot of folks out there that probably wish they were on the medical registry that aren't. Um, and to say that, you know, these products can exist on the medical side, but not on the adult rec side, you know, you know I feel like, there should be equal access, um, especially if a patient for some reason, you know, doesn't want to pay the $50 a year to be on the medical program, doesn't want to have the kind of relationship with the doctor, but still wants access to those products. Um, so um, I think that's just another angle here. I, I think, you know, I I hear all the comments and all the input, and I think I we can kind of move on because I think we're all pretty much in agreement here. So the next issue that we have to deal with for November 1st is um, whether the board should permit hemp or CBD to be converted to Delta 9 THC and if so, how it should be regulated. So Carrie, once again, I'm gonna ask if you don't mind to kind of walk us through um, you know, what this conversion is even and, and maybe some of the, the, the finer points of the debate. Okay, very good. And again, um, Stephanie is uh, just Sorry, as, Stephanie as well, yeah. Yep, Stephanie's just as versed in this as I am. And so our, our thoughts are from the agency. We've let hemp producers know that the making Delta 8 or a synthetic cannabinoid um, was, was no longer hemp. Um, we didn't want to see those products being sold as hemp. Um, and if it is allowed to convert to hemp of uh, CBD or CBG into a Delta 8, Delta 9, or even Delta 10 product, um, that's something that should be regulated in a tax and regulate market. Um, I don't believe these products should be able to be sold in a gas station or over the counter without some sort of regulation. Um, other states have allowed it. I was just down in Texas and you could get Delta 8, 9, or 10 from hemp uh, produced 
and, and you know, and there was no restriction on the sales, and they are intoxicating. Um, it just not not I think not a direction I think we should be heading in. So if we do want to allow these uh, to be synthesized from a hemp extract, I believe the sales should be regulated by the control board. Uh, my only concern with all allowing this is um, you're being you're permitting thousand square foot grows essentially in, on your smallest tier. Um, I can grow a hundred acres of hemp under a hemp permit extract all that and produce enough THC to supply the entire state without having to um, go through the, the process of getting a registering with the control board. Um, Carrie, can I just ask a question before I open it up? Um, this to me it kind of harkens back to the, when we had some challenges around bath salts where we tried as a legislature tried to prohibit certain combinations of chemicals and the processes were always changing so they're always one step behind like where people are at like if we're banning if if, if the recommendation is to say that delta eight should not be sold or uh, should not be kind of um you know, a consumer product. Are we going to just be back every year with some other kind of Delta Nine, Delta Ten, Delta Eleven? Is that a, an issue? Um, it might be a dumb question. I don't know. Well, I, I'm almost suggesting that CBD is still in a tenuous place. Um, federally but i'm sort of suggesting that all all cannabis products fall all cannabinoid products not seed or um, fiber or protein um, from a hemp plant but anything with the cannabinoids in it almost needs to fall under the purview of the control board um I, i'm not ready to go there but essentially i could see that happening in the future because uh, the cannabinoids, synthetic or not, are certainly um, why folks are buying these products. And right now, CBD, if you will, there's no age limit in most states. Um, they're taking that CBD and converting it into other things, um, which are largely unknown. Their effect is largely unknown. Um, some where we do hear that some of those effects are beneficial, right? But but I believe the market needs to be controlled, so you do know what you're buying. Nader, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was just going to mention. You know, you, you had me thinking with the bath salts analogy. Uh, you know, instead of trying to focus on what the new or updated chemical name or composition would be, uh, yeah, I think that. You know, to stay up to speed, you could just say that anything that has an impair, impairing effect that, or hemp could be regulated instead of trying to list all the new and various um, chemical compositions. Carrie, is there a way where we could require, if, if this was brought under our jurisdiction, um, is there a way that we could require kind of like a product registration so that we would know, you know, anytime a new product is kind of hitting the shelves, we would have uh, kind of some authority, some discretion to kind of regulate it. Yep, that, that would be a very good way to do it. You would see a label before the product hit the shelf. And not only products produced in the state, but products produced outside our borders. Um, Chris, do you have any you want to weigh in? Um, you know, I mean, for full transparency, I own a CBD company and we grow all of our hemp in the state. Um, Delta 8, I believe there's already, it's already prohibited in Vermont, isn't that correct? Chris, what uh, 
Stephanie, I'll let Stephanie address it. She, she drafted the letter. Okay. <laughs> um, it's true. We don't, um, well, it's not, uh, a hemp registrant is unable to produce the product with their, under their hemp license. Um, my understanding of how it's produced is you take a CBD isolate, which is not illegal to be sold to the general public um, or, or any manufacturing firm. Um, that is a legal in trade product in the state of Vermont. Um, and so, but you can't, as a hemp registrant, produce Delta-8 or synthesize Delta-8 from CBD. So a fair, a little, little nuance there. Um, we didn't yeah. say, we didn't say you couldn't do it. We just said it wasn't hemp. It wasn't hemp. So and you can't, and you can't do it under your license. Like you can't be a licensed hemp processor and do it and create that product and call it hemp. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, at processing hemp into CBD oil, I mean, you are at some point in the process also creating above 0.3 THC threshold, and then it sort of gets diluted again. But um, I don't know. I, I, I feel like a lot of this is, is bordering on like semantics. So, you know, it, but I do believe in the separation of church and state when it comes to the hemp program and the cannabis control board. I mean, they are, they are apples and oranges. Um, but I mean, I gotta keep, I could talk for a long time about this, but are we, you're, you're just saying the hemp, hemp could potentially manufacture some of the, uh, the deltas, the delta T, delta cannabinoids, um, but they would have to have a, they would have to have a, a different license than just the hemp license, right? That's, that's kind of what we're debating. Chris, that, that, that is the concern to jump in, David. That is a question on the table. Should the control board regulate those other deltas, eight, nine, ten? But only only when they're above the 0. 0.3 federal threshold. Correct. Right, yeah. I mean, it seems like it would be a conflict any other way. Not her than Jim. Sorry, that was an old hand. That was still on. Jim, do you want to hang? Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I, I wonder whether the, the question is the right question because I, I think of this process as, I hate to say, something like making ethanol out of corn. It's not, you know, at, at a time where all of New England is going to come online as a retail market, you know, from my point of view, one of the things that's going to really distinguish Vermont is what distinguishes our food as a product. It's natural, it is relatively unprocessed in its glory, and it's artisan based. And this is cheap THC. So the idea of product A, it is scary that we don't know all of the effects. I agree that we're going to be chasing chemical compound, you know. Uh, differentials over the years with things like this but even more so it's just not you know if i were to want to allow it to be produced i would want to have it be labeled separately not in you know uh cannabis product that, that natural you know uh un, sort of stomped on cannabis is going to be used and so to me it's a it really lowers i think uh, the quality overall of what people, I would hope, are going to expect from a Vermont adult use market. Terry, can I dig in with you just a little bit? And maybe it's not the best time and place to do it, but you know, if a Delta 8 product, but thank you. If a, if a Delta 8 product, you know, ended up on a, you know, like a candy aisle in a gas station. In Vermont, you know, what would the what would the consequence be? Is is it really in a legal gray area right now? Um, it 
that has happened, uh, remember that the Delta 8, uh, 8 cartridges were showing up um, at various gas stations, and yeah, they are intoxicating. It's similar to, it's, it's uh, similar to, to a lower percentage uh, pH Delta 9 product. It's about 80%, I guess, is, is what I've heard. I've never experienced the effects of Delta 8 uh, or 10. Um, but yeah, that they're essentially the same. It, it really does undercut uh, the market that you're trying to establish. Um, to have this product available at unregulated retail locations. Um, a lot of Vermont hemp growers did produce a lot of Delta 8 and that went to out-of-state markets where hemp is legal and, it, and it, you know, it's a way around a regulated market, um, which I don't think we necessarily need, need to allow. So then I'm trying to wrap my head around what we actually have to report to the legislature. It says um, whether the board should permit hemp or CBD to be converted to Delta 9, and if so, how should it be regulated? I mean, should the, should we say um, that it should be under our regulatory authority, um, but it's temporarily prohibited until we figure out how to regulate it? Um, is that kind of... You could, just to break in here, um, you could create a, another license category of hemp producers that the ultimate intent is for it to enter into a um, the, the regulated market that you're setting up so that you're capturing a license and, and it's somehow controlling the production of hemp for ultimate production of THC. I don't, I mean, I'm just talking here. I don't necessarily have details, but that's a way of dealing with it. So it's not, um, it's because it's not a hemp, you know, it's not a part of the hemp program. I mean, I, yeah, I know people are growing hemp, but it's really the intended market is not um, a CBD market, for instance. And then, and Carrie did say something about, you know, a future state possibly, um, but it could be a new license category. I mean, that's one way of thinking of it or not allowing it at all. That could be the other answer, um, which Jim pointed out, uh, just not permitting it. I, I like to chime in too, Stephanie, I agree with you. It's um, the Delta 8's really not going into CBD products. It's going into these loophole products where you can order them online and get a psychoactive effect very similar to Delta 9. Um, 10, I've tried Delta 8, I haven't tried Delta 10, but Delta 8, you know, 10 milligrams of Delta 9 THC is significantly stronger, but if you take enough Delta 8, it's the exact same psychoactive effect as Delta 9 THC. Um, I've got another just dumb question. Um, so is Delta 8 naturally occurring or does it have to be manipulated? It's naturally occurring in very, 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 currently, very small amounts in hemp plant. Correct. Like, uh, cannabis plant, I'm not sure. It's in cannabis and hemp. It is, okay. Yeah, but there's, so in hemp, it, there's less of it, but if it's concentrated, you know. Yeah. It, but for all intents and purposes here, it is a synthesized cannabis. That's what I understand, is that you, the, the process to create it is converting the CBD to the Delta-8. You would, the co it's cost prohibitive to try and concentrate the small amount that is actually naturally produced in the plant. So if we were gonna try our best to regulate this, or at least maybe have a kind of temporary pause button on this, we could say that um, any, um, we, we could just have a product licensure process. And if the process is using a synthesized cannabinoid, um, then we could put a pause on that until we really figure out more about these products and what their effects are. And yeah, and 
to answer the legislature's, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just a quick thought, um, you know, is putting a pause on this, is that something that could potentially lead to uh, black market as an unintended consequence? Well, I think, any, yeah, I mean, any regulated, any like prohibited product, will there'll be a black market for for sure, an illicit market. I would suggest less so um, because you need a lab to create Delta 8 or 10 from CBD. And those folks want to mass produce the product and get it on gas station shelves. Right? They want to, this is the cheap THC, a cheap pie. Um, if you're folks looking to procure product from the black market, are going to go for Delta 9. They're not going to go for some of the synthetic cannabinoids. And I wanted to add, James, you have two questions to answer. Um, one is, should this be allowed? And I believe that's still up for debate. The other question is, if it's allowed, should it fall under the hemp program or the CCB? And I think um, Stephanie and I are, we haven't really said it out loud. But it isn't hemp. We've said to the public that these synthesized cannabinoids are not hemp yeah. and don't fall under the hemp program. So if it's allowed, it should fall under the Cannabis Control Board because they are essentially intoxicating products. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to respect the time here. We have about two minutes left. Uh, Meg, did you want to have a, any input on this question? Um, to be honest, I'm not as familiar with the synthetic compounds, but, you know, just kind of in hearing about it and knowing the little that I do know, I, I think whether pausing it or at least um, finding, I guess, some time to do some additional research and then uh, finding a way to regulate, regulate those products I do think is key because they will just end up in the illicit market. Um, but to be honest, I'd, I'd have to do some more research and really get to know kind of what what the process is behind making those products. Yeah. Um, any other kind of concluding thoughts? And I would just say, I think that we as a board, I think Julie and Kyle have been listening in, um, have enough input right now to answer these questions. There is one more, and what I, would, what would I, I think I'm gonna do is kind of get the rough outline of the, our conversation into a report and then send it around to the full advisory committee for final input. You know, I don't think I'll call a meeting of everyone together, but I'll send it around um, so that people can have one last shot at kind of providing input. Um, uh, the last question that we have to answer um, for November 1st is kind of the future makeup and in, in charge of the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee. Um, Jim um, has led a very um, intensive process to make a recommendation on that. Um, this is essentially the group of folks that oversees um, the medical program and makes recommendations for improvement to it. Um, and Jim, I don't need to really go into the details of that report. I think you know we'll probably you know follow the advice that you give us because of the, the nature of the, the way you came to those conclusions and the input you got. I think is a much more robust process than we would be able to do here today. Um, so uh, I appreciate all the work on that. Um, and I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add just on that piece of our November report. Uh, no, I think you covered it. I mean, I, I feel really confident in the uh, nature of the deliberative process that we went through. We did not have a board that was necessarily in lockstep with each other. Um, we really did a lot of uh, extensive debate on it and did our best to extend the amount of public uh, input and uh, public comment that we took on the document uh, at the end. Uh, so I feel like it both represents both really sound compromise, but also uh, a real positive movement uh, for the oversight committee in the future in terms of a makeup that will be 
uh, patient-based and patient-focused and, and really represent, uh, uh, you know, down to the lowest common denominator. So uh, the vote is, is done and we have approved uh, recommendation and uh, I think you captured it other than that. Yeah, that's great. Um, any last concluding comments from the subcommittee members, exploratory subcommittee members? Okay. Well, again, we'll send, we'll try and push uh, some of these out uh, to you all for one last kind of uh, in, input um, opportunity. And if if you all are okay with it, uh, I'm, we're going to need to call call you back together again. We might wait a little while. Um, because uh, we don't have to, our next reporting requirement isn't until January. Um, the board has um, a few other things that we have to do in the, like more immediate in the in the interim. But um, I'll work with you all to schedule the, the follow-up meeting and um, we can deal with kind of delivery, on-site consumption, special event permitting, and um, uh, cooperative licenses and th th all the rest of the things we have to talk about for January. So, um, Bernie, is there anyone from the public that would like to make a comment? Nope, there's not. Okay, great. Well, in that case, I will uh, adjourn this meeting. Thank you all for uh, thank you all for joining. Thanks for the input. Thank you.